I would like to begin by introducing Leo Bersamina. Leo has painted on the left and the right. A San Francisco native and graduate of San Francisco State University, he headed east for his MFA at Yale, where he received the Phelps Burden Memorial Award for Distinguishment in Painting. And then he stayed east, living in New York. But Bersamina did come back to California, teaching here at UC Berkeley, at Stanford, Santa Rosa Junior College, and currently at Diablo Valley College. Pursuing painting, photography, collage, sculpture, and installation, Leo Bersamina has exhibited on both coasts and in Italy and France, in Pont Aven, where he also, Pont Aven, where he also taught. His work is in corporate collections, including Microsoft, and in the public collections of the US embassies and the Oakland Museum. The recipient of the Wallace Alexander Gerbaud Award and a finalist for the Insight Award of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Leo Bersamina's multifaceted art practice, which is represented by Paula Anglin, plays between formal abstraction and the natural world to reflect cultural identity. Please welcome Leo. someone else. Um, you know, when you look ahead, one, especially if you're, when you're younger, looking ahead, the path doesn't seem quite as clear as looking back. Um, but I made some good choices. I made some bad choices. Uh, I, and we'll, we'll speak to that during the day. And, you know, when I'm asked to, to speak about my work, I'm off, often actually a little embarrassed to, to talk about it in some ways in that it's sort of, you know, most artists, they have their work and it's a very clear path and, and, and I'm one who, who likes to sample. So oftentimes when I show my work, it seems a little bit all over the board, but that's just the way it is. Um, UC Berkeley holds, I hold dear to my heart. It's uh, one of the, the, the place where I got my first major break in terms of teaching. Um, I, I, you know, I love the student here, uh, I, and and I love the proximity to the tennis courts as well. The, the you know, look, oftentimes I would look out in between crits, and and I, there was a graduate student here when I was teaching here who also played tennis, so we would sneak out in between critiques, and uh, so so I remember that fondly. Joe McKay, I don't know if you guys remember Joe. <clears throat> um, but uh, you know, I was uh, I was having a conversation in the lobby earlier. Uh, you know, about diff the different types of students that one comes across when they're teaching. And, uh, and being here at UC Berkeley, you know, of course, you know, I'm, I want to talk about my art, obviously, but I can't help but to think about my, my life as an educator as well, being that this is, you know, the, the first major, you know, institution where I taught. And, and, you know, currently I'm teaching both at Diablo Valley College, which is, a, if you don't know of it, it's a junior college nearby. Uh, um, where it's actually the biggest feeder to UC Berkeley, a uh, great school. And I also teach, still teach, adjunct at, at uh, Stanford. Um, and, and I do that because I like, I obviously like teaching uh, because I'm driving to Stanford and, I'm, and I live in Marin and I'm driving out to Diablo Valley College and you know, there's this big triangle that I do. Ooh, careful. Uh, so, I was asked to compare the two, the, the Stanford and the, and the Berkeley student. And I love telling the story to my Stanford students. You know, the difference between the Stanford student and the UC Berkeley art student. And, and in a nutshell, I'll, I'll, I'll boil it down to something very simple. The, the UC Berkeley student is not afraid to make mistakes and to challenge themselves in a way in which they, um, they feel uncomfortable. And I think there, there's a, as, a, as an art instructor, there's something very fresh, refreshing about that. And, and the Stanford student to me, I, are there any Stanford graduates in there? <laughs> 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 they, uh, they tend to want to do things, they want to know how to do things the right way, the, the, the best way, and the most efficient way. And oftentimes that's not 
part of the creative process, right? The, the creative process needs to allow for mistakes and self, you know, uh, self-exploration. So there it is. Um, the UC Berkeley student still is my favorite student to teach. And, and uh, you know, I, I will always hold this place dear to my heart. So, so I think I've warmed the, the audience to my favor. And on that note, um, let's look at some work. So I'm going to show you sort of a, a, a sampling. You know, obviously, can, does that work? Yeah, OK. Um, the work that I do is both, I, I work in abstract, as, as Jan mentioned, in abstract modes and representational modes. And to me, they're really part of the same thing in that um, I'm building something, I'm using color, I'm trying to create space, I'm trying to compose a, a you know, two-dimensional uh, flat surface in, to, to be a believable space that you can actually step into with your mind's eye. Um, so in, in, in that sense, they're really the same, same thing you we're looking at. So what we're looking at here is something that kind of started when I went away to, to grad school. It's, this is, a lot of this is uh, a result of, of graduate work. Um, you know, being a California kid, growing up, you know, surfing, living on the beach, and, and, um, and, and going away to New York and New Haven, Connecticut, such a new place for, for someone from out here and such a foreign place, and what a different culture it was, you know, interacting with <laughs> Ivy Leaguers. These are people that I would see, like, in movies and, and you know, and uh, on, you know, at the UN and, you know, as presidents and, you know, what, what was I doing here? And so I, I, I needed to quickly find a place that I felt comfortable. And that place would, for me, was, well, what do I do here? What do, how am I going to start making things, you know, in this foreign place? And I thought, well, I'll start with myself. So it, I started with these, uh, what I call self-portraits. And what they are, they're sort of loosely derived from, at the same time, right before I left for school, I was, I was living in an you know, old loft up in Potrero Hill in the city, and, you know, and, and the, it was changing, the city was changing, we were having all these sort of, you know, this new high-tech stuff coming, and, and, uh, and you know, the artists were moving out of my building, and, and you know, these um, high-tech people were moving in, and one, one of my neighbors was someone from Genentech, and she, you know, she fancied herself as an artist, and, and and in that way, I was, I felt good about her being in the building. You know, I was very protective of this building, a bunch of us salty old artists living in it. And, you know, we, we it was in a part of Potrero Hill that was not the nice, you know, it wasn't the shame, papa, uh, shame mama, you know, the fancy part of Potrero Hill. It was down in the flats where I lived across the street from a metal scrapyard, you know, and it would wake me up at seven o'clock every morning. Well, anyway, this neighbor of mine, um, sequenced, gene, sequenced genes, right? You know, and she would like come home with all this work, and I th found the the actual objects beautiful and wonderful, and and you know, and, and I thought, well, uh, I, can can I can we do this? So she extracted some blood and took it to work, and came back with these beautiful, you know, photo gels of of um, these genes, the my genes. You know, it was me. You know, a picture of me. And I, and I thought, well, you know, maybe I can use this. So when, I, when, you, when you look at this work, you probably see references to, you know, gene sequences. Um, and, and what the, uh, looking at this, this painting up here, what they actually are are photos and color, photos from places I had been, the blue in the strands, and oceans that I'd swim and surfed in, the blue of the strands. And to, for me, that was part of you know, what makes us who we are. Where we go, when we travel, what we think about. It's not just um, our education or, you know, or our, our, it's our experiences. So 
I would, I would try to like take this kind of uh, ethereal thought and try to make it a little more concrete for me while keeping the language open for people to interpret the work as they, however they, they seem fit. So, you know, by the way, please feel free to ask questions while I'm moving along, um, while I'm talking about the work. It actually will help me <laughs> sort of figure out, you know, you, as artists, you know, you know, we make things, right? We get up in the morning, we find reasons to make things, we make them, we're thinking about it usually, or we're listening to NPR, or we're listening to car talk, or we're listening to the baseball game, but we, we have reasons for making the work. And sometimes you'll be listening to something and you're making, and then you'll realize that you've been doing it for five hours, and you look at the th and you're amazed at what you've done. You sort of just lose yourself in it, right? So, and then, and then we, we finish the work, we put it on the wall, and people talk about it, and they have ideas, and, and you know, the, they have their theories of what it, how it relates to the art world, um, or other artists, or other work. And for me, my work is not art about art so much as art about life. And, and you know, there's, a, there, there's artists who make art about art, and there's artists that make art about their experiences. And I think I fall more under that category. Um, and that, that painting, just for reference, is uh, about four by six feet, four feet tall. Um, and it's oil and collage. And this is another thing that I was working on in grad school. And what I did with these, um, they're actually cell portraits, they're photo uh, and paint, uh, but, the, but the spirals are actually photos that I took of myself of my skin in various uh, you know, lighting situations. Okay, so the blue, the cool uh, ones are, are probably under fluorescent light, okay? And then the warmer tones are, are more under natural light, sunny day kind of thing. And then the others are, uh, you know, in halogen or... So you get this wide range, and I, and I did it as objectively as I possibly could. You know, I just, you know, I would try to set the camera on depth of field. I was taking a lot of photo classes at, at, at grad school as well at Yale. Um, so I was very interested in photography and the way that, you know, the camera captures information as opposed to apprehending information, that, which is what painters, what we do generally, we're apprehending it. There's some apprehension in the way we're looking at something and filtering it through ourselves, whereas a camera, it's, it doesn't, it just captures it, it grabs something, right? The, it's up to the, the, the photographer to apprehend it, but if you're flipping the camera around, you know, and not really looking through the, through the lens, then, you know, you're, it's as objective as possible, for me, anyway. That's what I was thinking. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. So anyway, I was apprehending this stuff, and then I would, I would try to create these, you know, and I, at the same time, I'm very interested in design. I'm very interested in, in, uh, in the way nature, natural forms, and the way they, they sort of organized, and the way patterns are set up in both our lives and the things that we see and, and our habits. And the way, you know, if you were to sort of visualize your route to, uh, you know, your, your, your path to the cafe that you go to every single day and, and how, if you, could, if you could document that visually, how that would look, you know, I think about these things. Another work that I did was when I was a kid, I had to put paper out. Well, I had three paper outs, actually, at the same time. And I, and I would overlay these these paper routes together and come up with, and I wish I had a picture of that, sorry, but I'll describe so in doing that, I would map my life, right? And, 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 and try to visualize my path um, as I lived my life. Um, here's another uh, example of, of that. And these, to me, are more based on natural forms that are found in nature um, that my eye, which I'm a sampler, right? I like to sample, I, something catches my eye and I try to make it fit in the scheme of things, of, of the things that I do. And these are just little pen and ink drawings that I would do on, um, that I did on, what did I do them on, casein or tracing paper. I would do these draw, and then I would embed them in these, you know, rich, they're, they're about this deep, okay? And I would put layers and layers of, of, uh, of wax and resins and things and kind of 
so that you're just peering through them. And they would overlap, but there would be space in between each one. And again, there, you know, some people see umbrellas, some people see other things. But I, you know, again, like I said, I'm very interested in, in design. This uh, is another work, you know, similar to the other. But with this, I did something a little different and maybe a little hokey, or, uh, but I thought it was intriguing nonetheless. When I first saw that, that, um, that gel with the, with the sequence genes, you know, they're semi-transparent, right? And you could see through them. So what I thought I would do, this is probably uh, seven by six feet, seven feet tall by, uh, sorry, seven by five. Um, and it's a work on panel. And I started get, getting into the idea of what I did was at, when I installed it in the show, I put it, I made this, there was, there was a window in the room and I, we built this wall and I cut a hole out and during the day the light would pass through the back of the painting and it, it was pure accident. And in doing that, it would change during the course of the day but the light, you know, it would, it would glow from within and I thought that that was sort of an interesting effect, both in, um, visually and optically and also conceptually, I thought, you know, the light passing through us as well. Kind of the same idea, but changing the composition, the idea of capture and release and, and how, you know, how I could try to create a series with this idea in mind. And, Creating a series for me is probably the most difficult thing because I just, I lose interest very quickly in, in what I'm doing and, you know, nothing is, uh, as soon as I make it, I think I can make it better, right? I don't know if you guys are that way as well. And again, working with the same materials and, and um, just changing the palette to sort of create, you know, uh, color relationships and, and value relationships. You know, they're fairly, you know, when you look at them, there's the idea of their space, but they're, they, they, you know, I try to create them so that people, you know, a language and such that, that people can, can interact with them without having to be told what it is. But it's so interesting to know what it is. Is it? You know, sometimes it's such a, a letdown to know what it is. <laughs> I worry about that sometimes. So that, that's nice to hear that it is interesting because I feel, you know, I put a lot of thought into what it is. You know, again, these are all using those either it's photos of my skin or photos of places I've been or oceans that I've swam in, like I said, or beaches, sea, you know, land. It's like, you know, there's, there's all sorts of information happening in there. And again, they're very deep and rich. Um, and this one was based on a high, and, high tide and low tide chart for the year, of two, I think it was 2005 when this was made. So, you know, again, trying to take things that, I'm, that I use every day, you know, I use a tide chart when I want to check the surf or when I want to go fishing or diving or whatever, you know, it's something that I use. And it's something that we also, our, our lives and our bodies are, you know, we, we, we um, are affected by the tides, you know. And this, this is just a sampling of things that, you know, through teaching, teaching has is, is actually been very enlightened. Before, you know, I, in grad school, we talk about why we go to, why we went to school, you know, and as a young artist, you know, you want to be an art star and you're, you have all these plans of making it in New York, or at least, you know, some of us did. I know a lot of my, my uh, schoolmates at Yale did, and some of them did make it big, um, and, and whatever that means, but, you know, Going back to teaching, it was really refreshing to like just draw and make and and get back to the basics and basic materials and you know using things that you sort of discarded as a you know conceptual painter things like gouache you know and charcoal and you know and and it was just enlightening to go back to those materials and start making things. Um, using those materials and getting back to the basics in that way. Um, teaching to me has been, is really fed my creative process in a rich way. Yeah, it takes, out, it takes energy to teach and you know, I come home and I feel like I've been building a house all day. You know? It's just like you're giving to your students and you know, you're getting excited about their work and, and you, know, you come home and 
you can be tired, right? And yet you get up and you do it the next day, you know? And then it's summertime, you're thinking about those light bulbs going off and, and you know, and, uh, and it makes your studio practice that much more important, you know, being in the studio. When I was just a working artist, to me it was sort of, I kind of lost sort of ground a little bit, like, you know, there was no tension other than when you're in the studio. There's no, and when you teach, there's something that you're kind of butting up against, and I like that in the practice. And like I said, I was getting interested in photos and, and the way photos, uh, photography, again, the way it, it captures the image um, in, in a rich way. And then I would paint over them and try to create like sort of a dialogue between the paint and the, and the captured image. And you know, these are just colors that I would see, I would sample from, from the places. This is actually, and the photos, the places that I would take, you know, in the dark room, I would treat it sort of like a, a painting studio, you know. I didn't know what I was doing in the dark room, you know. I, I had been te taught the very basic uh, dark room skills in terms of color. And, you know, my photographer friends and, and fellow students would just like roll their eyes and go, what are you doing in there? What did you do to that print? And, you know, this thing was just a little 35 millimeter uh, negative that I blew up to like s seven feet tall and you're not supposed to do that right as a photographer but you know I wasn't interested in photographs I was interested in experiences you know more than than um, and not to say that photographers aren't interested in that but as a painter I think I was more interested in sort of the the idea that you know, at the time paint photographs were this being exhibited the scale of paintings, and I was playing with that idea as well. And I would cut them up and put them back together, you know, and create sort of a bend. I would take pictures from two different perspectives and then put them together and try to bend the eye in a way um, that was kind of low tech, but appeared, but had a conversation with with the digital world and the digital information, yet, you know, I, this is like basket weaving, really, you know, in a way. So the idea of craft and high art sort of came together, and I was always interested in craft and crafting things and making things and designing things, you know, and I think it's important for me in my practice that design pays a, plays a major role in the work in that you know, you're, you're, you're breaking things down and putting them back together again in an organized manner. And then not only was I interested in the way they came together optically, but also, uh, you know, tactically as well, the way things, the way they, you know, the, the, this was, I was thinking of like a physical memory of a place, right? And this photo, if it, if it's, if it helps uh, at all, it was taken on a trip to Fiji and, I, and when I think of that trip, I just think of me, my, my body remembers that trip more than my mind in that I was in the water eight hours a day and just the feeling of the sun, you know, beating on my head and, and, uh, and the water and the little, you know, jellyfish steam <laughs> and, you know, it, it just, I remember that. So I got on, and then not only that, but the idea of water and how it moves and, and sort of the, the way that it, it ebb and flows, I think um, I tried to sort of capture all that in a, in a piece, and, and I did a, quite a few of these. And this is, uh, this, this painting, or this uh, photo collage, it's actually a digital photo collage, is called My Favorite House's Island. And on this island, is every house that I lived in in my entire life. And they're all stacked up, and, and minus a couple that have been torn down. Uh, but I also did a drawing based on this imagery called uh, 38 Houses in 42 Years, something like that. And what I would do is I would take, starting with the first house that I lived in, I would draw it, and then I, I would erase it, 
so that it would just be a ghost drawing, right? A res the residue of that drawing, and then I would draw the next house over it. So, in time, it was, it was, and then I left the le last house um, on the drawing, but you would see all the other houses behind it, and. Unfortunately, I lost that slide, so um, it's, it's on the internet somewhere if you want to see it. So, some, you know, I had a, something happened in my life where I lost someone dear, and, and, uh, and I started seeing the world and seeing through my eyes in a very sort of rich, light way, like where there was light everywhere, and and there was a certain clarity to the way I interacted with, with my world. And, and other things were going on in my life where, you know, both really sort of rich and enlightening and, and lovely, you know. And sad, too. So, there was a certain somberness to it. But at the same time, um, I felt like for the first time in a long time, I was actually living you know, and sometimes it takes something as dramatic as losing someone to realize that. And through that experience, I wanted to make work that spoke to that, but wasn't totally about that, you know, so that you, the viewer, could find meaning or some sort of pleasure or satisfaction in, in the imagery. And not only that, I, I wanted to, to get back to you know, the basics in terms of drawing and painting representationally. So I got back into that again. Um, and as a result, I, I made a series of these works, which often are called, this is called everything all over at the same time. And I met someone in my life too who you know, shared a passion for the outdoors and doing things like skiing and 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 to me it was like why not why why can't I why sh there's no reason not to make work about this because it's it's me it's part of me so so there were these works that I just you know I found extreme pleasure in making and uh, it's sort of hard to talk about because I'm still in the middle of making these, you know, and when, and I haven't quite processed what they mean yet, but at the same time, it's kind of clear. It's sort of about that moment when, especially, this is called Sea Ranch. Uh, this, this next one is called uh, Incoming. It's the first one I entitled Incoming, Incoming Down Under. I had taken a trip to Australia and you can see that that Norfolk pine is prevalent all over, you know, the, the, the South Pacific. But anyway, the idea that there's a certain time of day when you're driving or you're walking or you look up and the sky is just a certain way where it makes you reflect on not only the day but your life. And so I, I try to capture that moment and it's usually at dusk or dawn, I've, I've found. And, you know, it's when your, your mind can really find clarity in things that you've done and people that you've been with and you know and and this this actually was I came to this image driving home from Stanford one day you know I was driving home and I was heading towards you know 280 I look up and the sky is doing this I swear it was doing this and, and you know and so I, I just whipped out my iPhone and I took a picture of it and you know and it turned into this painting and, you know, um, and it just kept happening. And then, I, we, and then you know, we, we travel. Travel does this too, right? Not just that time of day, but traveling. Your, your, your senses are at their, their most, you know, they're peaked up, right? And you're, you're observing everything and you're smelling and you're, and so this is from a, a residency I did in Italy in southern Italy, Basilicata. And this was looking out from the studio. And, and I couldn't bring a lot of materials to this for 
you know, because we're flying and you, you can't pack a lot of stuff. So I would just use, I would try to break down the paper and, you know, and, and this is um, more of the same, really. The last few are kind of, kind of speak to, to what we're talking about. And then I started inserting landscapes to get a little more literal, right? Um, tops of buildings and, and these are all my, from my neighborhood, just driving around, you know, looking up. They're all on paper, yeah, all on paper. And then I would come in and I would start using the idea of the photograph as well. I would paint on some photographs. And here's another. Pardon? It's, it's my good friend, Steve Baker. <laughs> and I did all these out at the Headlands. I made these in the Headlands. I had a resident, two-year residency out there. I think my time is about up, so I'm going to wrap it up with this image. How large are they? Okay, so this one is about 30 by 40 inches, and that these are small. These are about 12 by 10 or 14 by 12. It's all painting and drawing. Yeah, there's no no photo. I mean, I reference photos, but they're all painting and drawing. Uh, acrylic, that's an acrylic with some gouache. Um, this is gouache, primarily. Um, I like gouache because it's both, it can be both opaque and transparent, you know, and you can, you can use water to really push it out and it still will retain its integrity. As opposed to, I mean, what I, what I don't like about Acrylic, well, I, love, I work with oil, acrylic. I use a lot of different materials. But gouache, to me, is, seems to be the most versatile. And if you use egg yolk, if you use it as a tempera, um, tempera, it, it acts like an oil paint as well. You can actually underpaint using gouache with egg yolk and then paint over it with oil. So, you know, to me, whenever I travel, a set of gouache comes with me. Do you flatten those pieces? Do I flatten them? What do you mean? Stretch the paper. Oh, do I stretch it? Yes, I do. Yes. Um, I staple them to the wall and just put it, I, I would just coat it with water and it would flatten out. Um, just dampen them with a sponge or something. Usually, though, they, they stay pretty flat, I've noticed. You know, I, I will, when I do use the, the material, I staple about every or push pin about every four or five inches all the way around just to make sure that to the best of my ability it stays flat. Yeah, but I do but we do have to roll. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.